morning, everybody. How are you doing? Good morning, everybody. How are you doing? All right, church. Uh, if you hear my voice in the lobby, I invite you to, uh, to come inside the auditorium, the sanctuary, and we're going to have a time of worship. But if you're in the room, I want to invite you to stand up on your feet, and we're going to uh, step into a time of worship. So let me, let me pray for us before we get into uh, this time of worship. So Heavenly Father, thank you so much that we get to be here together uh, to make a joyful noise and uh, make a noise that is so uh, pleasing to you and allow this to be worship and be offerings to you, um, Jesus. So uh, we pray this in your holy name, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Let's worship. I was born.
excited to have you this morning at our first service. We are about to dismiss our kids from the service today. And so if you look over here, you'll see our amazing kids leaders. They would love to take your kids to kids ministry. And so if you're ages three to five or you're in K to four, you can start making your way over to our amazing kids team. You guys are going to hear a lesson today from scripture. You get to have some fun together um, as you grow in faith and also with your leaders as well. And so as the kids make their way over there, I'm just going to take a moment and just pray for our kids as they do that. So Lord God, we just thank you for the gift um, that kids are. We thank you, God, just for their faith, um, Jesus. And I just pray, God, that as they head into kids ministry today, Lord God, would you just deepen their faith, deepen their relationships with one another. God, I pray they would have fun um, as they learn more about you, who you are, and their calling and their purpose, God, that they can find in you. So we love you, Jesus. Thank you, God, for all that you're doing. We pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, kids, you guys can make your way to your kids' classrooms. Great. Well, again, just want to welcome you to church this morning. We're excited that you're joining us here at Northgate. If I haven't got the chance to meet you yet, my name is Joshua. I'm one of the pastors here. Um, and if you are brand new today, we really hope that you find home here at Northgate. Um, we're going to sing a couple more songs of worship together. I'm going to hear a message today from Pastor Josh um, sharing just our next part of our Witness Sermon Series. And we really hope today that you have a moment with Jesus because we truly believe that a moment with Jesus can radically change and transform our lives. So as we enter to this next part of worship, I encourage you to open your hearts. You may see people raising their hands um, this morning, singing with their voice. All of this is expression of our love and our adoration of Jesus and what he has done for us. And so I encourage you this morning to express your love to Jesus through song as we worship and we press in, in this moment together this morning. So let's continue worshiping today as we enter into his presence. Spirit. 
Good life, but I've got my own job. 
We're not going to rush this moment this morning. I sense today that God just wants to restore joy in some of our hearts this morning where life has felt heavy, where our circumstances have seemed dark. about how powerful your name is. And so God, today we just give ourselves wholly to you. God, would you open our hearts to you? God, I just pray that in deeper ways you would just deepen our understanding of who you are and what you have done for us. Lord God, that you have set us free. God, that you've adopted us into your family. God, that we are sons and daughters remind us of that reality in our hearts this morning, God. Draw us close to you. Draw us, God. Those that feel far from you this morning, said before, it is so good to have you in church this morning. It's so great we get to gather together as the body of Christ this morning um, and get to worship Jesus together. And so we're excited um, just for all that God is doing um, and all of his goodness and his grace um, towards us. And so um, in a moment here, um, we're going to transition. We're going to watch a quick video talking about a conference that we're having at the church called Consumed Conference, a youth conference that we run here. Yeah, that's exciting. We're excited about um, Consumed Conference. And so before I say anything, about Consumed, check out this quick video about highlighting what Consumed was like last year. Yeah, so there it is. 
Yeah, that was Consumed Conference last year. And so um, if you're not familiar with Consumed Conference, Consumed is something that we've been doing here at the church since 2003. And so we celebrated our 20th anniversary last year at Consumed Conference. So 21 years this year. And so we're really excited um, about Consumed Conference. Um, it's designed for students in grades 6 to 12. And it started off in this church as just a small little thing and then grew um, from there. And there's so many different stories of just life change and impact over the years of Consumed Conference. Conference. There's stories of, of youth pastors that just felt like they wanted to quit. They were done with what they were doing and really just felt reignited towards their calling towards the next generation through Consumed Conference. There's been stories of students coming out of really dark situations and coming to know um, the salvation of Jesus. Um, I've gotten, I got to go to Consumed Conference over the years when I was a youth. Um, and I just remember times and moments of some of my friends making decisions for Jesus, of um, some of my friends wanting to make decisions to get baptized through Consumed Conference. Conference. So it is an amazing thing um, that we get to do um, here at the church, and we're really excited for this year's conference. Um, we're going to sell out this year, and so we're going to have over 300 students and leaders from all across Vancouver Island and the Lower Mainland all here in this place. And so we're really excited um, about this year. Um, our theme this year is selfless, and our heart for conference this year is that um, students would come to this place, and our heart for the next generation is that they would come to this place so they would allow themselves to become less so that God can become more, that God's influence, God's calling, God's purpose will become more um, and overflow through their lives. Well, that's our heart. We're really excited um, for this year at conference. As I said, we're selling out this year, and so it's going to be a great year um, at conference this year. And the only reason that Consumed has been able to um, happen for all of these different years because of people that have sown um, into the ministry. Um, Moses and I are not the first. We won't be the last um, directors of Consumed Conference. There's been many different directors, many different volunteers many different people that have hopped on board to actually make Consumed a possibility um, in this church. And it's an amazing ministry that we get to be a part of as a church. And so I want to invite you this year to join us um, in Consumed Conference. What we're looking for this year specifically, we need some hands. We need some people that are going to come um, and serve um, and help us in different points for the weekend. And so to pull Consumed off, it probably takes about 100 volunteers um, to actually make it happen, to do all the things that we need to do to make um, this space a place where we can invite students in um, and just have an environment where they're able to be impacted um, by Jesus. And so there's several different areas um, that you can serve um, at Consume Conference. We have security teams, we have merch teams, we have um, food teams that are in the kitchen, um, we have uh, administrative teams, registration teams. We have several different teams um, that we that we have, and none of them require any like pre um, skills or expertise. We can teach you all of that and what that looks like um, for Consume Conference. We need the people that are willing um, to step into those spaces. And I'll make one quick mention um, of one specific um, role that maybe would require a little bit um, of expertise. Is specifically right now we're looking for. Two, um, two people or one person. We're looking for um, members to lead two of our meals um, for Consumed. And so we need someone to, new, uh, to lead our breakfast um, and also our dinner um, at Consumed. And so we'll help you with the shopping. We'll get all the team in place for you. You need someone to help organize people in the kitchen. And so if you have previous experience in a kitchen or if that's something that you would like to be on, get on board with, um, we would love to chat with you about that. So you can chat with me um, about that after service. Um, we're going to be after this, during the five-minute break and also after service, as well. We're going to be in the lobby. Um, there's going to be sign-up sheets there. Or if you have any questions about conference, you can chat with us there. Um, there's also going to be volunteer sign-up on our website as well um, to kind of yeah, gather us together um, to yeah, make this a place where students are able to come and be impacted um, by Jesus. So we want to invite you to join us um, to join us in that. And for the conference, it's April 26th to 28th. Um, the question normally is, do I have to come for the whole time? No, um, you don't have to. Um, there's several different time slots. If you can only do a couple hours, um, that's great. Um, and awesome. And so you can come chat with our team a little bit about that. It may be a specific time um, or area um, that you might be able to hop in and join us for Consumed Conference. And before we continue, I'll just leave you with this one last um, thing. And so scripturally, um, there's no uh, youth conference in scripture. We actually don't even see that there's a youth ministry, as we would call it, as we would see it as it functions today in scripture. But there's a call. There's this call all throughout scripture for the previous generations to pass on faith to the next generation. We see this all the way from the Old Testament to where they would say, write this down, make sure you share this, that they would know that I am the God who brought you out of the land of Egypt. We see all the way in the New Testament, Timothy, um, 
Paul, writing to Timothy, is praising his mother and his grandmother, Naomi and Eunice, for passing down faith to Timothy and the faith that he now has because of the way that they were able to pass on faith to the next generation. There is a calling for previous generations to pass on faith to the next and upcoming generation. We believe in this next generation. We believe um, that God is just going to continue to develop and continue to lead them and consume them with a passion for him that would ignite them towards mission and his calling and his purpose. And so we invite you to join us as we pass on faith to the next generation. If you have any questions about that, you come chat with us. We'll be out in the lobby. Um, we would love to talk with you about that. But other than that, that's all we got um, for Consume Conference for today. We do have a couple other announcements. So you can check out the screens and check those out. Good morning, Northgate. My name's Tamara and I'm on the staff team here at Northgate. And today I've got a couple of announcements for you about some things we have coming up here at the church. Consume Conference is only three weeks away. So if you're a student in grades five to 12 and you haven't signed up yet, then make sure to sign up today. It's going to be a great weekend together and we can't wait to celebrate with you. We're also still looking for volunteers for Consume. So if you're interested or available between April 26th to 28th to help us out for any period of time, we would love to chat with you and get you involved. You can head to the lobby and speak with someone at our booth there, or you can head to thisweek.engate.ca and fill out the form there. Northgate Church members, our AGM is coming up next Sunday after the 11 a.m. service. We'd hope that you'd make sure that you can be there so that we can reflect on this last year and look ahead together. We'll have a lunch provided for you, so no need to worry about that. If you're not a Northgate Church member yet and you would like to be, you can head to thisweek.ngate.ca and fill out the form there to get the process started. And finally, on May 12th, we'll be doing baby dedications here at our services. We're so excited to celebrate this new life together. And so if you would like to get your child dedicated, you can head to thisweek.ngate.ca and fill out the form there. That's all I have for you today, church. Enjoy the rest of the service. Be blessed. Great, there it is. Well, we do have also one more announcement uh, for you. And so tonight um, is the first Sunday of the month. And so we have worship night tonight. Yeah, and so uh, worship night is an extended time um, of worship um, that we just get to have um, and we normally do on the first Sunday of every month. So we want to invite you to join us um, at that tonight. We're going to be starting at 6 p.m. here at the church. would love to have you at our worship night tonight for that extended time of worship. We're excited about that. It's going to be good. Um, and another thing that we get really excited about, another moment in our service we get excited about here in the service is taking up an offering. So, hey, we believe that God loves a cheerful giver. We just see what God is doing through the mission of the church. And giving is a way of us contributing um, and sowing into the work that God is doing in his kingdom through this church. And so if you would like to give this morning, you could do so any of the ways outlined on the screens. Um, and before we continue um, in the service, I'm going to take a moment and just pray for our offering. And so, Lord Jesus, we thank you that you have blessed us. God, we thank you um, just for the, the vision of this church, God, that... Um, isn't just only existing in this generation, but the previous generations, God, that have sown into the work that you are doing through this church. We thank you for that and praise you for that, for the faithfulness of those that have sown um, into Northgate. And God, uh, today, Lord, would you continue just to stir our hearts for mission? God, would you lead us um, to you today and just continue to draw us to you, God? Stir our hearts, God, for where it is that you are calling us to contribute, um, what it looks like for us to um, give to the work, Lord, that you are doing through this church. So, God, we love you. Thank you for all that you're doing. We bless the offering this morning. We pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, we're about to head into our five-minute break where you can grab a coffee and chat with someone new. Um, and during that five-minute break, we do have an icebreaker question for you. And so the icebreaker question for today is, if you could only listen to one song for the rest of your life, oh, man, what would it be? What would it be? You better choose wisely because that could get, it'll probably get annoying after a while. But anyways, you guys got five minutes, chat with someone new, grab some coffee. We'll be back here in five minutes.
Good morning, everyone. Welcome to church. Oh, it feels so good to be together. Um, I don't know about you, but I love the season of Easter. Last uh, weekend was obviously our Easter celebrations. It was a big Sunday. We had our baptism services, and then we had uh, two services here. Wasn't that great? Who was here? Anyone here? Woo! Come on. It was amazing. And I don't know if you know this, but actually this season of Easter, uh, there's actually a name for it. It's the season uh, where the ch church historically has celebrated Easter uh, is not just Sunday, it's actually a whole season. So the period of time from when Jesus rose to when he ascends, there's a 40 day uh, time period and we call this Easter tide. So we're in Easter tide. And I think that's really important that we as a church take time to consider and reflect on the resurrection. Uh, last week, Evan talked about the two disciples uh, on the road to Emmaus. And so we're in our series, Witness, which is kind of looking at people who witness the life of Jesus and the impact that it has on them. And the two disciples on the road to Emmaus, they didn't immediately recognize Jesus, even though Jesus was right beside them, that they were still in this time of disorientation. And today, I, I want to continue by looking at this theme of resurrection, and we're going to, uh, in particular, focus on John's account of um, John chapter 20, where Peter and John run to the tomb, and this kind of in-between moment where the signs of resurrection are there, but they haven't yet fully engaged that reality. Um, the disciples are actually in a moment of disorientation and are kind of stuck. And I actually really appreciate that scripture shows this part, right? Like, it'd be very different if the resurrection story was just like, they, they wake up Sunday morning and they're like, get their cup of coffee and they're like, right, it's resurrection day, let's walk down to the tomb because we know that's going to be empty and Jesus is risen and we're so excited and we, and we know Jesus told us this would happen and we're there and there was no disorientation. But the fact that scripture actually records this disorientation, this sorrow, this grief, and this struggle that the disciples had is relatable to us because that is what we feel. And I think as people, we relate to this moment of feeling stuck, of being disorientated. And how do I get from disorientation to reorientation? How do I get from this place of, of wanting the resurrection, but I, I can't pivot. I can't make that shift. I remember a time uh, during my time growing up on a, on a ranch where I actually got a vehicle pretty stuck. And if anyone has grown up around equipment vehicles, you likely could relate to the story. I mean, most people, if you've driven vehicles, at some point you, you get a vehicle stuck. And it's always an interesting experience uh, actually ignore it, kind of getting to a place where you're like, actually, I cannot get myself out. Uh, so I was, I think, 16 at the time, and it was springtime. I was out checking our, our cattle with our quad bike, and uh, we had these alkaline sloughs, these kind of areas which was alkaline soil, and it's actually just terrible to drive on because it's, it's kind of crusty on top, but if you sink through it, you're toast. I mean, you're gone. And so I, I was kind of edging around the slough, and I was like, I'm good, I'm good, cruising. And then suddenly I feel the tires sink, and I, I know I'm in a bad situation. Put it in four-wheel drive, pin it, and I just sink it all the way. And totally, you know, this thing is buried, buried. And so I don't really want to tell my dad at this point, that I had buried the quad. That's, you know, a 16-year-old guy. I'm like, I don't, I want to solve this on my own. So I, I go back, I get my brother, I'm like, bro, we need to get the quad unstuck before, you know, dad sees it. It's pretty stuck. So we get the pickup truck and, you know, like, I don't know, about 100 feet of, of toe straps, and we drive out to the field and back up the truck, hook it to the quad, and put the, the truck in to drive, and it sinks too. Boom. And now we have two vehicles stuck. And I'm like, man, I really do not want dad to find out about this. We're like, okay, let's go get the small tractor. It's, it's lighter. And then we'll, we'll get a, a whole bunch of chains. So we go back to, 
Unfortunately, he hasn't noticed this happening. So we go back to the farmyard, we get the, the small tractor and about 100, 150 feet of chain, go out there, hook it up to the, so we have quad, truck, now tractor, hook it up and I'm driving the, and I think we had to draft my younger sister into this too now to drive the quad. So I'm driving the truck, my brother's driving the tractor and same thing, one turn of the wheels, boom, sinks. And so I'm, I'm pretty distraught because the reality is not only have we just sunk three vehicles, but now I, I will probably have to go tell my dad. So I'm kind of playing out this conversation. How do I make this sound okay? It's not really a way to describe this. So it's like, hey, dad, um, I got the quad stuck and the truck and the little tractor. Um, he was quite gracious. So then it was another tractor and 400 feet of cable, and we got them all unstuck. Whew. But I think we can relate to this. There's times in our lives where it can be hard to acknowledge where we're at. The reality is that we can be stuck. We can feel totally challenged. And to, to actually acknowledge this is where we're at is hard for us. So to move out of the place of being stuck requires first acknowledgement of where we're actually at. And for me, hearing the stories of the early apostles struggle to recognize the resurrection is actually encouraging because it helps me to understand that I too can struggle with unbelief, but that there is a way through that. See, we can be blind to our own hearts and so we listen to the stories of others to help us understand where we ourselves are at. This is so important. We actually have to look at scripture and the stories of the apostles and they can be insights into us understanding where is my own heart stuck? Where is my own heart struggling in unbelief? And how do I reorientate? You know, if we're honest, sometimes times of sorrow and delay can cause us to see things incorrectly. And our past experiences sometimes informs how we see the resurrection. So delay, sorrow, and experience that we've had in life can be the very things that shape how we approach resurrection and resurrection reality. It's like, yeah, that's resurrection reality. I know that should have an impact on my life, but right now, how? How, does, how do I engage that? So that's what we're, what we're gonna look at today. Delay is hard, and delay typically is disorientating. I remember this one time we were up in northern Saskatchewan with one of our Soul Edge teams serving uh, in a community called Pelican Narrows, a beautiful community. Um, and we were there running uh, VBS programs, teaching in the schools, and it was just like a full week of intensity. Um, and by the end of it, our team was really tired. We were sleeping on mats in a gym floor and, you know, just eating kind of spaghetti night after night kind of. And so they're serving all day and they're tired. And so when the final day where we're leaving to go back home comes, they're like so excited. And I go out to start our 15 passenger diesel van. Um, and uh, it's like minus 25, go out to start it, won't we'll start, dead, so dead. So then we boost it, we try everything and we cannot get this thing started. I'm, I'm like, I'm a farm boy, I know how to get things running and I cannot get this 15 passenger going. After like an hour and a half, I'm like, I gotta tell the team we're not going home. And so I walk in they're, they're like, bags are packed, ready to go. Let's get in the van. I'm like, guys, we're not leaving today. In fact, we're stuck here at least another night. Sorry, guys. And it was just like, you could hear a pin drop. That disorientation of like, there's major delay now, they were so distraught by it, really struggled with it. And we can have moments in our lives much worse than that, where we experience major delay to things that we'd hoped for, things that we'd long for, and we're like, what do I do now? 
I want you to hold on to that feeling because this is actually this delay or this struggle, this disorientation is the very moment that the disciples feel at the resurrection. <coughs> Excuse me. Let's turn now to John chapter 20. We're just going to hang out here. So if you have your Bibles, we're going to hang out in the chapter 20 of John's gospel. Early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb and saw that the stone had been removed from the entrance. So she came running to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one Jesus loved, and said, they have taken the Lord out of the tomb and we don't know where they have put him. So Peter and the other disciples started for the tomb. Both were running but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. Don't you love that, just that little detail? It's like John wants to make sure that it's recorded that he beats Peter to the tomb. He's like, the disciple whom Jesus loved outruns Peter. I love that. It's just like, we're just, it doesn't really fit, but we're just going to put it in there so that's recorded forever. Outran Peter and reaches the tomb first. He bent over and looked in at the strips of linen lying there, but did not go in. Then Simon Peter came along behind him and went straight into the tomb. He saw the strips of linen lying there, as well as the cloth that had been wrapped around Jesus' head. The cloth was still lying in its place, separate from the linen. Finally, the other disciple, who had reached the tomb first, also went inside. If there was any doubt, John made it clear. I made it there first. Uh, they, he saw and believed. He saw and believed. They did not understand from Scripture that Jesus had to rise from the dead. Then the disciples went back to where they were staying. So what's happening here? Mary goes to the tomb um, to anoint Jesus' body, um, to be there with Jesus. It's this place of like her sense of connection to Jesus is his physical body. And she, so she goes there. And when she gets there, she discovers that the stone is rolled away and that the tomb is empty. And so in the midst of sorrow, of disorientation, she fears that the Lord has been stolen. So she doesn't run back to the, the apostles saying like, he's risen. She says, they've taken the Lord, right? They've taken the Lord. So she, she sees a sign of an empty tomb. The signs of resurrection are there. But rather, she interprets it as Jesus has been stolen. His body has been stolen. And Peter and John run to the tomb. This is really fascinating, isn't it? That we can, we can have signs of resurrection. We can see signs of God moving. Yet because of our sorrow, because of our grief, because of delay, we can actually misinterpret those signs. And then the disciples arrive there. See, they're running to the tomb thinking the body has been stolen. That's what Mary just said. They've taken our Lord. And so they are running to the tomb not with anticipation of resurrection. I find this encouraging. Like we almost think like, oh yeah, they're waking up and they're so excited that Jesus has rose from the dead. No, they're running because they're expecting that Jesus' body has been stolen. And so when they get to the tomb, they expect disorder, like things thrown aside, and they see something very different. When they get to the tomb, they see order. The grave clothes are folded. It's not signs of a robbery at all. We see this face piece, it says, the face piece of Jesus, the cloth that would have covered his face is folded, signs of order not signs of robbery. It says that 
John saw and believed. I think because of the nature of Easter messages that we often hear, the, the focus rightly is on the reality that Christ is risen. But the disconnect can, can be for us that we can think, how, how does this relate to my story? How does this relate? How does my story fit into the resurrection story? And this is what I, I want us to engage with. So a helpful thought for us to actually think is, what's the disciples story? How did those who walk so closely with Jesus respond to the resurrection? You know, I've been guilty of thinking that it was just instantaneous. Jesus is raised and the disciples get it right away. But that's actually not the case, is it? How does times of sorrow cause us to misinterpret? Mary sees the empty tomb and makes the assumption that Jesus' body has been stolen. And I think this kind of speaks to her inner reality, right? Oh, another bad thing. That's what she's anticipating to be there. Something bad to have happened. She's not anticipating resurrection. I love how honest scripture is about that, right? It's like, it doesn't, it's just like, yeah, this is how she felt. And we are like the disciples, right? We struggle. We can feel so disorientated. And so the story of the disciples engaging with this, I find encouraging. See, the promises of life are grounded in resurrection. The promises of life are grounded in resurrection. In John chapter 11, Jesus talks to Martha and he says this statement. He says, don't you know that I am resurrection life? I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live even though they die. And the challenge is that we can sometimes let Things like uh, revivals, maybe we're like, oh, I'm gonna read stories of revivals and these moves of God as the highest picture of what life could be. And those are encouraging to read, right? I love reading stories of revivals, but actually it's the resurrection, which is the greatest picture and reality of the life, the new life that we have. It is not that the revivals throughout history are not important, but they cannot become for us the ultimate picture that informs what we think his life coming looks like. It's the resurrection. And the temptation for us as people is that just because we don't feel the resurrection, we can put aside the resurrection of Jesus, not believing. But when we place Jesus first, his resurrection first, the fact that he is raised, we then can start to find ourselves in life. See, if we are led by feelings, we will actually delay the work the Spirit wants to do in us. This is, this is sort of the challenge. The feelings of disorientations are okay. It's normal. So I just wanna say, that's okay. If you at times feel disorientated in your faith, that is okay. The disciples felt that too. They, they had sorrow, they had grief. And we can't just go like, I'm in sorrow, disorientation, grief, and I just need to jump to, I'm good, I'm great. That just, we don't see that in scripture, and that's not true. But we also see that the disciples they shifted their eyes onto something. They didn't stay focused on what they felt. They didn't just say fixated on what they felt. And this is a problem for us that we can fixate on the feelings of disorientation and actually can delay the reality of the resurrection working in us, the reality that Christ is risen, there's hope and there's an anchoring for our souls in him can be delayed by a focus 
on our feelings rather than the Spirit's work. There's this interesting verse at the end. Verse 10 says this. Then the disciples went back to their homes. What? So they see the signs of resurrection. It says that John actually sees the order and he, he believes. He's like, something shifted in him. In that moment when he sees the order in the tomb, he's like, it's happening. So when he was running, he's like, I don't think it's real. When he sees the order at the tomb, something shifts. So it says, he saw and believes, and then he go, it says the disciples go home. Why? Why do the disciples go home? I would say they did not return home out of resignation, but rather expectation. You see, if we recall, what was the home for them? All throughout the stories of the gospel, Jesus is meeting people in their homes. He goes in to a home where Peter's mother-in-law is. She's sick, heals her. Goes to Capernaum often in the home teaching. He is in people's homes constantly. Do you know the disciples met Jesus in their homes? And so when the resurrection happens, they're like, let's go home. Because there was an expectation that Jesus would meet them in their homes. And resurrection would start to break through in their homes. Their, their eyes shifted. Their expectation was that Jesus would meet them in their homes. And he does. He shows up. They're gathering in a home and Jesus shows up in their midst. Could it be that they go back to their homes because home was a place where they first met Jesus? The home was a place of encounter. I think the reason we struggle sometimes with this verse is our culture is often escapism. That we retreat. I'm going to retreat away. But for them, it wasn't a retreat. They don't retreat away. They go home with expectation. And so sometimes we escape. It's like, what do I, I want to escape the pressure. I want to go to Netflix and chill. That's more escapism. I don't want to even look at my feelings. I don't even want to acknowledge how stuck I am. I'm going to escape to the place of whatever it is. This is not what the apostles are doing. So this is really important that we see their stories, that they are not escaping, that they are acknowledging their disorientation, but they are seeing the signs of resurrection and they go home in expectation of Jesus meeting them there. I want to go to verses 11. John records for us this intimate encounter that Mary Magdalene has with Jesus. So Mary returns to the empty tomb. So we have this moment where she goes to the tomb, she finds it's empty, and she's like, oh my goodness, his body's stolen. She runs to the apostles, tells them. They run to the tomb. They see it's empty, and they're like, something shifts in them. They go home. She then goes back to the tomb, and John records this. Now Mary stood out this side, outside the tomb crying. As she wept, she bent over to look into the tomb and saw two angels in white seated where Jesus' body had been, one at the head and the other at the foot. They asked her, woman, why are you crying? They have taken my Lord away. Here she's, she's still in this place of feeling grief, feeling like it's been stolen. Her connection to Jesus has been stolen. And she says, I don't know where they have put him. At this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there, but she did not recognize him. 
And it's like the tears of sorrow are blinding her from seeing Jesus. And he asks, woman, why are you crying? Resurrection reality, Jesus standing right in front of her and she can't see it. Woman, why are you crying? And thinking he was a gardener, she said, sir, if you've carried him away, tell me where you've put him that I can go get him. And then Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned towards him and cried in Aramaic, Rabboni, which means teacher. Then Jesus said, do not hold on to me for I have not yet ascended to my father. Go instead to my brothers and tell them that I am ascending to my father and your father, to my God and your God. For me, this is so powerful that John records this for us. Intimate. It's not until Jesus calls her by name. It's a name he would have spoken many times. Mary. Personal. A personal encounter. So Jesus, on his way to ascending, he's just conquered death. He's on his way to the Father. He stops everything to go back to the tomb to meet Mary in her disorientation. That's the type of father we have. She could have discovered it another way, right? You know, there's Jesus, the crowd of people talking to them. Oh, okay, he is risen. But he doesn't do that. He shows up in the midst of her grief, sorrow and speaks her name. See, this is, this is the truth, that sometimes our hearts are stuck and we don't know how to enter into resurrection life. And it's him. We need an encounter with him. It's his voice. He speaks her name. One word from Jesus changes everything, doesn't it? When Jesus calls her name, it's personal, individual, tender-hearted. Having our sight restored is it about an encounter with Jesus where we hear his voice spoken in a personal way. And I just sense that even today that there's some in the room where you're like, I want to know the resurrection reality of Jesus. I want to know what it is to experience that life. But I'm in disorientation. I'm stuck. For some of us, the first step is actually just acknowledging that. Just being like, yeah, I'm stuck. It's a good step. But then to start to lift our eyes up. To start to hear his voice speak. See, the starting point is to never just stare at our sorrow or death, but rather to look upon his resurrection, to behold him, to celebrate his resurrection. We look upon the one who is raised, knowing that I am united to him. See, it's his resurrection that swallows up death and loss. Swallows up our death and loss. You know, when Jesus comes to the disciples, he, he bears the marks of the cross on his body. This is, this is a consoling image, isn't it? He does not obliterate our humanity, but redeems it. He does not obliterate humanity, but redeems it. So in our delay, our sorrow or disorientation, we have to lift our eyes off just what we see right in front of us to actually see Jesus. Worship team, you can come on up. Isn't it encouraging that the apostles, 
those who had walked with Jesus for three years, who had heard him say, I'm gonna die, I'm gonna rise again, I'm gonna die, I'm gonna rise again, I'm resurrection life. They struggle with disorientation. The scripture is really clear. They struggle, they get stuck. But they don't stay there. They don't stay there. And maybe you feel stuck today. Maybe you're like, I don't know. I don't know how to move from here to there. Well, there's an invitation I sense from Jesus today that, as Joshua said, joy would be restored, hope would be restored. And we like things instantaneous, don't we? We're like, I just want to go from here to there. Man, there's been times where I've been in sorrow, grief, disorientation. And I don't like that. I don't like being there. And I wish sometimes it would be instantaneous. But it's not. But Jesus does actually want to get us to life, to resurrection reality. And it starts with me saying, okay, Jesus, I am here. This is where I'm at. Be honest before him. And then we start to look to him. Say, I see you. That's truth I can hold on to. You are resurrection reality. I'll cling to that. And sometimes we're a bit like Mary, like we're we're in sorrow. Tears are coming. And it takes a word, it takes Jesus saying. we can see him. Can I just invite you to stand? We're just going to invite the Holy Spirit to come. See, all across this room, in this space, I love the church body, because right now in this room, we have people who are in all different places, all different moments in their walk with Jesus. For some, you're like, man, feels like breakthrough is coming. I'm seeing fruit. I'm seeing just his goodness. Resurrection reality is what I'm living in. And we celebrate that. That is incredible. That is amazing. And for some, you're like, I just feel totally stuck, totally disorientated. So we got, we're all here. We're all here. And so we just say, come Holy Spirit. If you're comfortable, you can just close your eyes and just put your hands out in front of you. As we just say, Holy Spirit, come. Right now, just be honest before him. Jesus, we say we, we need to meet you today. going to stay in a posture receiving as our worship team leads us in a song of response. Uh, our prayer teams are going to be on the sides. If you'd like prayer, just please, during the, the worship song, just feel free to move to the side and ask for prayer. We're not going to rush this moment. I believe Jesus wants to speak to you personally. He wants to lift your eyes to him. So all over this room, just, just declare the resurrection life of Jesus, that you are united to him. Jesus.
Bring the sorrows and trade the joy from the ashes of new. that line in the song. Oh, what a Savior. Sing hallelujah. Christ is risen. Mm, our hearts can just hold on to that today. So as you go from this place, may you know his joy, his peace, his word speaking to you personally. If you'd like prayer today, just, just encourage you. Our prayer teams are going to linger on the side, so please go ask for prayer. Uh, just a reminder, it's worship night tonight. So if you're just like, oh, I just need to linger in worship, come tonight. It's a great space just to come and be in a time of worship. Thanks for being here today. It's great to have you. Have an amazing week. Bless you.